Hello and congratulations for listening to Non Theology, the show here to fill the podcast shaped hole in your heart. You can visit us online at nontheology.com, and though we aren't likable in real life, we are likable on Facebook at facebook.com slash nontheology. I am one of the two hosts, Gabe, and I'm joined, of course, by the other of the two hosts, for today at least, Dan. Hi. How are you doing, Dan? Welcome back. I'm good. I'm good. How are you? I'm doing just fine. You were on the show previously to talk about your deconversion from Judaism, and then also some stuff about gay marriage. Sounds vaguely familiar, yeah. Uh, vaguely, yes. I sort of repressed that <laughs> at the back of my memory. I think a lot of our listeners repress our episodes as well, so they probably have right. no idea what I'm talking about. True. true. And they'll, they won't remember this anyway. So no, they won't. No big deal. So, Dan, what are we talking about today on this episode? So, we're talking about my deconversion from Judaism and gay marriage. No, what? You need to repress that one. This episode. Oh, all right, right. Okay. We already did that. Right. This episode, we're talking to Ellery Shemp. That's right. He's like my hero. He's my hero, too. I've actually mentioned on the podcast before that he is kind of my hero. I think he is an awesome scientist and secular activist, and I secretly want to be like him in many, many ways. But... He's going to feel awkward when he's listening to this later. (laughs) Yeah, a little bit. But it's cool. I sent him a huge fanboyish email inviting him on the show. He accepted, and my dream came true. He came on. So we had a really, really interesting conversation, and I'm sure that our listeners will just enjoy the crap out of it. Enjoy the crap out of it. They shall. Indeed. All right, for this very special episode, Dan and I are joined by nuclear physicist, secular activist, and American hero, Ellery Shemp. Ellery, welcome to the show. Uh, Thank you very much for the invitation to be here. It's really a pleasure to get to speak to you because there's so many things that you've been able to do with your life, both as a scientist and an activist and all the other things. It's such an honor to get to speak to you. So thank you so much for coming on the show. Oh, thank you. Look forward to it. So today we're going to be talking a little bit about some of the things from your life, in particular the Supreme Court case that you were involved in from a young age, and as well as some of the activism that you've taken part in later on. Well, um, I got involved in the whole concept of separation of church and state when I was a 16-year-old high school student in Abington, Pennsylvania, a suburb of Philadelphia. At that time, Pennsylvania had a law that required that 10 verses of the Holy Bible be read or caused to be read at the beginning of each school day in every classroom throughout Pennsylvania. Was that individual students needed to sit down and open a Bible, or was that read to them? Well, in the younger grades, of course, the teacher read the Bible, Mm -hmm. um, and 10 verses without comment. By junior high school, um, teachers got bored with all this, and so (laughs) they would tell uh, the kids, and this always happened, of course, in the morning at homeroom, and... um, You know, so the the teacher would say, all right, Billy, you read the Bible today, and Susie, you do it tomorrow, and we'll do it in rotation around the room. That turned out to be fairly silly, because (laughs) (laughs) what happened, hardly anybody remembered when it was going to be their turn. So you came into school, you were only half awake, and uh, somebody would say, oh, it's your turn to read the Bible. So you would stumble around the room, look for the darn thing, and open it at random, um, (laughs) and then read, usually extremely poorly, (laughs) and all you had to do was stumble through 10 verses, and you had done your duty. And after that, it was common practice, although not in the law, to recite the Lord's Prayer. So the kids would stand up, recite the Lord's Prayer, and then, of course, the flag salute. In high school, they had a public address system, so then there was a certain group of students that were selected to do the Bible readings every morning, an individual recitation of the prayer, of course. So I objected to this, and I thought that it was a clear violation of the First Amendment, which says that Congress shall make no law regarding an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. And this was clearly an establishment of religion, because it was carried out under the authority of the government via the teachers and the school system, of course. And it seemed to be an improper way to influence students to uh, have a, a faith belief, uh, particularly because it, it, it so many ways contradicted both moral values and ethical values and science. Um, I mean, you couldn't possibly go to read Noah's Flood, for example, and then go to a science class when you realize that that was total nonsense. Noah's Flood never happened. Right, right. I also like to point out that the moral values of Noah's Flood are rather questionable. We know that the um, right wing evangelical groups are very much opposed to abortion, but I'd like to point out to them that in Noah's Flood, zillions and zillions of unborn fetuses were killed. <laughs> Right. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a good point. I think it's interesting to approach this. You know, like you said, there's so many of the values in the Bible that are in really stark conflict with the values we hold today, not just the scientific values that we have from science class, something like that. But, you know, there's all sorts of different things. Uh, first or second Timothy somewhere in the Bible says that women shouldn't be allowed to teach in front of men and all sorts of things. Yeah, so, the Bible is pretty much anti-women, um, anti-feminine rights. Uh, right. And it's full of rapes and vengeances and genocides even. I mean, someone has 
calculated that more than one million people are killed in the Bible. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, I, and for no particularly good reason. <laughs> exactly. For divine reasons. <laughs> yeah, for divine specifically reasons. Specifically ordered by God to commit genocide. Yes, that's right. You know, the Ten Commandments are not any particular virtue to human beings. The first two or three have nothing to do with moral values. They have to do with a God belief. And I also right. like to point out that there are actually 613 commandments in the Bible. Right. And you can find this out by just typing into Google 613 commandments and they all <laughs> come up, most of which have no relevance to contemporary life whatsoever. Yeah, exactly. So you objected to this as a high school student, right? Yes, I was a junior in high school. So this was in um, the late 1950s? This was actually 1956. Um, when I, I, so I made a protest, and my goal was to show that the Bible was not the only holy book. So it happened that a friend of mine's father had a copy of the Koran on his bookshelf, mm -hmm. so I borrowed it. But this was just an accident. I didn't know anything about Islam at the time, nor did anybody I knew. It could have been the Bhagavad Gita or some other uh, Buddhist or Hindu or other scripture. But I chose it just because I wanted to make the point that the Bible was not the only so-called sacred book. So during the Bible reading, it was required that you pay very strict attention. You had to put away all any other work, couldn't finish up your uh, homework. Put away your Koran. And <laughs> yeah. So I sat there at my desk, and I opened the Koran, and I read it uh, quietly to myself. And I did not stand up for the Lord's Prayer. And that's what got the teacher's attention. Uh. So he came over and said, look, you've got to obey the school rules and blah, blah. And I said, look, as a matter of conscience, I could no longer participate in these morning devotions. And then the religious nature of this was, was apparent because they were known as morning devotions, even though the school argued that this was not a religious ceremony at all. It was only to instill morality or inspiration for the day or something like that. <laughs> that just sounds incredibly phony to me. <laughs> Remind me, I'll tell you a funny story about that, uh, the inspiration. So um, the teacher didn't know what to do uh, and sent me to the principal, of course, who also didn't know what to do. Right. <laughs> but, uh, and I had been a good student. I wasn't getting in detention for chewing gum or smoking or all that sort of thing. So this produced cognitive dissonance in a very big way because the principal's view was that, you know, there were all the goody-goody kids and then there were the rotten apples in the barrel. Well, suddenly I was in front of him. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and I was an A student, and uh, so it didn't make any sense to him. But he said I should recognize that as a matter of respect, I should just go through with it, notwithstanding my personal feelings. And I said that, um, well, I said again, I thought it was a violation of the Establishment Clause, and, and it was not a proper thing for the schools to be doing. Now, I, I have to say to everybody that the schools had no choice. It was a state law. Neither the yeah, principal, yeah. nor the teachers, nor the school superintendent could, could stop it. In, in fact, the law was very clear about this that said that a teacher who didn't do this Bible reading exercise could be fired. Oh, goodness. Uh, very simple. So the principal sent me to the guidance counselor because he decided that he had a disturbed young man on his hands. <laughs> and the, the guidance counselor was keen to know whether I was having trouble with my father or uh, respect for authority or... <laughs> Are you having trouble for respect for authority? Yeah, I want to be a scientist. <laughs> or difficulties at home that uh, might <laughs> be the cause of all this. And I said, no, I just have a disagreement about Bible reading. Everything's right, fine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so in the course of time, I returned to classes. And uh, when I got home, I recounted the story to my folks over dinner. And my father suggested that I write to the American Civil Liberties Union, the ACLU, which I did. I typed out on the two fingers of my dad's typewriter and a letter and mailed it off with a uh, $10 bill enclosed. That turned out to be significant. Because uh, $10 actually represents about $85 in today's money. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, so the, when the ACLU got it, they were impressed that a kid could save up this amount of money from his allowance and grass-cutting chores and things. And, uh, and in the course of time, they took it up as a, and decided that it was a serious matter uh, that was worthy of the ACLU's involvement. And that, of course, was critical because they found attorneys that would serve pro bono. The ACLU found a really excellent attorney, Henry W. Sawyer III, in, from a well-known Philadelphia law firm who prepared absolutely excellent briefs and spent a year doing it and researching it and looking at the history and thinking of how the arguments would be presented. Anyhow, so then we filed suit in federal district court in Philadelphia and asked them to declare the Pennsylvania practice unconstitutional. This was a special court composed of three judges, and the appeal from that court was directly to the Supreme Court, bypassing the appeals court level. Anyhow, we won three to zero. Mm -hmm. The court ruled that it was a violation of the Establishment Clause and also of the Free Exercise Clause, because there was no provision for a child to be excused from these things. 
And one of the things that uh, motivated me was a sense of the great unfairness of it. I had noticed that my Jewish friends were decidedly uncomfortable with certain biblical passages that would typically come out at Christmas time or Easter time mm-hmm. or something like that. Um, you know, the Lord's Prayer is not any part of the Jewish religion, of course. Right, right. <laughs> Much less free thinkers and, you know, Buddhists and any other kind of religion you can exactly. think of. So this was a decidedly an imposition, and it was unfair. It was simply unfair to people who were not traditional Christians. So um, anyhow, we won three to zero. The um, school board decided to appeal it to the Supreme Court, and there was a little bit of legal history that probably irrelevant. And eventually, though, in 1963, the Supreme Court, in an eight to one decision, that's impressive, eight to one. That is impressive, yeah. Um, we hear all the time about five to four decisions yeah. nowadays. And it had um, conservative and liberal justices all joining in on this. And I'm sure all different faith perspectives as well, Roman, Catholic, and Jewish. And in fact, Earl Warren was the chief justice at that time, and he assured that there would be a Jewish justice, a Catholic justice, and a Protestant justice who all wrote concurring opinions. Mm -hmm. So it was very broadly based. And when that decision came down, it ended these practices of Bible reading and forced recitation of the Lord's Prayer or any other prayer throughout the whole of the United States. Yeah. So that's why it's sometimes called a landmark decision. Right, exactly. Yeah. So all of our listeners out there who were not forced to pray in school, you have Ellery Shemp to thank in part for that. So. <laughs> and I'd also like to mention that there was a similar case that was brought by Madeline Murray, later Madeline Murray O'Hare. Right, just uh, a few well, years later. Famous right? atheist. Uh, she started her suit in 1960, a couple of years after ours already got into the courts. But it was almost an identical issue having to do with the similar practices in the state of Maryland. She was in Baltimore, Maryland. And uh, so the two cases, by sheer accident, happened to reach the Supreme Court at the same time. So the Supreme Court consolidated them or joined them together and wrote only one decision for both cases. So the formal name of this whole thing is Abington versus Shemp and Murray versus Curlett. Right. That's a really incredible story. What was it like for you? I mean, this is around the time of the height of McCarthyism, I guess. We have the privileged perspective of history to see that it was actually on the decline, but you probably didn't have a good sense of that at the time. What was it like? I mean, I I can't imagine myself as a high school student preparing for college and getting in this federal court entanglement over this sort of thing. Well, the McCarthy era was a very serious issue, of course, when they were looking for communists and traitors under every bed. And, uh, of course, in the thousands of letters that we got, we were very frequently accused of being a communist or or worse. (laughs) So, um, fortunately, Abington was a fairly civilized uh, community, so we didn't face too much opposition. And I myself graduated pretty soon and came out to Tufts University right here. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I was out of the loop, and the whole case would have ended at that point if it not been for the fact that I have a younger brother, Roger, and a sister, Donna. Oh, okay. Because you cannot bring a court case unless somebody is directly affected. Of course, the case was brought by my parents in the name of their minor children. I mean, mm-hmm. 16-year-olds can't bring lawsuits. But it was extremely fortunate that uh, Roger and Donna remained in school all during during the legal processes up to the time of the Supreme Court's oral arguments. Otherwise, the case would have been, in legal terms, mooted. You no longer have standing. Yeah. So, um, you know, there's a lot of good luck about all this. I had the good fortune of growing up in a family where my parents knew about the ACLU. I grew up in a Unitarian church tradition that favored separation of church and state and encouraged people to, well, to think for themselves and to understand that there is no one religious truth that is superior to all others, and uh, the whole idea that there's one belief outlook, uh, one size fits all, that was never part of the Unitarian ideas. And so I said good luck to found the ACLU, they found a good lawyer, good luck to have my brother and sister, good luck in many other ways that led to our case reaching the court in its significant way. I had a similar experience in high school where I stopped standing up and saying the Pledge of Allegiance because I thought it was wrong that God was in there. Unfortunately, in my case, it never escalated to anything interesting because the teacher just ignored me. But back then, I was still Jewish. I still believed in God. I just thought it was wrong that there are Americans who don't believe in God, and they shouldn't have to talk about God in order to pledge their allegiance to the country. I, I think that's a, a very important point. And the history of the Pledge of Allegiance is rather actually kind of amusing. None of our founding fathers ever said it. Abraham Lincoln never said it, because it wasn't <laughs> written until 1892 <laughs> <laughs> yeah. by Francis Bellamy, who was a minister with rather socialist leanings, actually. Mm-hmm. And nobody ever took it very seriously until World War I came along, and then, of course, there was a great outburst of patriotism. And But the original version of the pledge did not 
not contain the phrase under God. That was only added in 1954. And that actually, in a certain way, led to some of my um, objections to the whole concept of Bible reading and God talk in the, in the schools. So in 1954, it was the Knights of Columbus who wanted to insert this to distinguish Americans from the godless, atheist, uh, communists. Uh, <laughs> right. And its religious um, objectives were very clear because after they passed this law, the entire Congress marched out to the front steps of the Capitol singing Onward Christian Soldiers. The entire Congress? The entire Congress. Oh. Um, and then recited the new version of the pledge. Oh, that's terrifying. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it was, and there have been a number of challenges, legal challenges, to the phrase under God. So far, they haven't succeeded unfortunately, although there's a very interesting case right here in Massachusetts brought by David Niosi of the um, American Humanist Association, and they're challenging the law not under the federal First Amendment, but under the Massachusetts Constitution. Mm -hmm. It's a novel legal approach, and in fact, the hearing was held before the Supreme Judicial Court here in Massachusetts just uh, July, I think it was, claiming that this phrase under God introduces a discrimination that the Massachusetts Constitution forbids, discrimination on the basis of, of gender and race and all sorts of things, including religion. Mm-hmm. And this is clearly a discrimination against non-believers to have to recite under God. And it confuses things, although I'm not a great fan of meaningless rote recitations of things, but um, to confuse loyalty to one's country and a feeling of patriotism with a God belief mixes up two things that should not be mixed up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. All right. Let's talk a little bit about some of the reaction to you bringing bringing this court case forward. I know that you said that the principal of your high school was having some cognitive dissonance, seeing that you were both an A student and bringing this thing to bear, and he had an interesting reaction to what you were doing. Come time for college applications, right? Uh, I didn't know this at the time, and of course it was one of the great fears that my fellows in high school would frequently express to me that I was going to be ruining my college chances. But I applied, and I actually got accepted at every college I applied to. But uh, I later learned from the dean of admissions at Tufts that the principal had insisted that my application go to his desk <laughs> to every college that I applied to, which was unusual. You, you know, usually the, actually it was the guidance counselors who sent out all these recommendations and transcripts and things. Mm-hmm. And uh, Tufts, as a matter of courtesy, always sends to the high school a letter saying, we've admitted one of your students. Uh, when he got this letter, he was apparently so outraged that he called up long distance to Tufts and demanded and pounded his fist uh, <laughs> that Tufts rescind their decision <laughs> on the grounds that I was the rotten apple in the barrel and Tufts would forever regret uh, admitting me. <laughs> this was very amusing uh, to learn this because this was now 1958 and calling long distance in 1958 was a rare and an expensive thing. <laughs> you only call grandma on long distance on her birthday or something. Right, and, right. <laughs> but uh, Dean Stearns um, said it was the most amazing phone call he'd ever received during his entire time as Dean of Admissions. <laughs> Yeah, that's such an incredible thing to have happen. I remember what it was like applying for college and, you know, later on applying for other things. I can't imagine that someone like the principal of my high school would send letters of disrecommendation to all the places I was going and then call them up once I was accepted. It was certainly unusual. (laughs) Yeah. Um, But fortunately, it came to naught. Um, The other part of the story I'd like to mention, well, I mentioned that I went off to college, but my brother, Roger and Zana, they got hassled, not nearly as badly as Madeline Murray's kids, uh, Garth and Bill, who were really beat up rather horribly and many bad things happened in Baltimore. You know, Roger was knocked around and pushed down, and Donna felt absolutely mortified. She blamed my parents a bit for that, but she was at a critical age for young girls and um, didn't want to be singled out. Or, or And, and you know, some of her friends' um, mothers told their daughters not to play with Donna and not to come and visit her and things. But the family received about 5,000 letters. And um, you know, we're, this is back in the time before computers, before Xerox machines, and my parents made an effort to answer everyone that had a return address. The letters broke down into uh, about one-third were supportive in many ways, a lot from the Jewish communities um, and relatively few non-believers at the time. And one-third disagreed with us in terms that you could say, well, people of goodwill can disagree. And, of course, one-third or so were absolutely hateful and filled with all kinds of horrible garbage and things. And one of the things that we found was rather amusing was that we immediately became a member of whatever group the writer hated. So you expected to get um, letters that said, uh, you know, what are you, communists? What are you, Nazis? What are you, Jews? What are you, Catholics? You know, on, on. Um, we, the ones we didn't expect were ones that said, what are you, Presbyterians? <laughs> From this, though, one of the things we learned is that, of course, in the United States, it was bad not to be Christian. It was very, very bad to be a communist. Mm -hmm. But absolutely the worst possible thing you could be was atheist. When people called us, you damn communist atheist, they had reached their height of outrage. 
And it's very peculiar and unfortunate, of course, that um, fear and hate go hand in hand. And somehow atheists invoke this sense of fear and then the corresponding hatefulness that comes from it. Um, very weird. But it hasn't gone away. Atheist is still not a favorable word. Yeah, yeah. And that's been one of the things that generates a lot of the discussion within the atheist and secular communities. What word should we use? Because within the community, I think a lot of people think that atheist describes themselves very well. But people outside of this group don't understand that. They think it means something terrible and awful and violent. The sense that I developed from all this is that they feel that people who are atheists have no moral values, no ethical standards. You know, then if you're a non-believer, you can go out and rape and kill and plunder and murder and all that sort of thing. But of course, this is total nonsense. But right, that's right. the that's what many people associate with atheism, immoral and likely criminal. <laughs> Right, yeah, I, I like to ask people, you know, if you found out that there really is no God, would you do all that stuff? And they usually either try to avoid answering the question or they come up with some technicality or something. But if that's the way people think, then are you really a good person if you're only doing it because there's the reward of heaven or the punishment of hell? That's a very good point. I think it was Christopher Hitchens who told this story that somebody made exactly that argument. If it weren't for my belief in God, I would feel free to go out and and, and rape and kill and murder and whatever. And uh, Christopher Hitchens said, well, in that case, for God's sake, keep believing. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Society will be better off if you just keep up whatever you're doing. <laughs> exactly. Well, let's talk a little bit about some of your activism um, in the secular community since the ending of that court case. You've been involved in a couple of different organizations, including the Secular Coalition for America. What's that been like and what does that organization do? Uh, the Secular Coalition is um, a group of other organizations that have come together to represent the secular separation of church and state value. And one of the neat things about it is that we actually have a full-time lobbyist, uh, Edwina Rogers, and a staff, and they actually go to Congress and meet with uh, members of House and Senate and lobby for our points of view and to try to make sure that there is a solid constituency for secular values. And um, been a great proponent for letting people know that we uh, non-believers actually do vote, and we are a voting bloc. Now, I notice that lots of politicians love to pander to the masses, ending every speech with God bless America or something like that, but I'd like to be pandered to myself and, <laughs> exactly. and, and not have these uh, God blesses in, imposed on us all the time. They're unnecessary. I'd like to point out also that the oath of office, which is written in the Constitution, in Article 6, does not contain the phrase, so help me God. It's just not there. People have added that, but it's not in the Constitution. The Constitution itself never mentions God or the Bible or commandments or any such thing. Thing. Right. Um, it mentions religion just twice, and those two times the word no is attached. <laughs> <laughs> I'd also like to point out that the Bible provides no model for good society or for our government. The Bible never once mentions freedom of speech. The Bible never once mentions democracy. The Bible never once mentions voting. It never once mentions um, three branches of government or any uh, anything that we take for or a fair trial or checks any, and balances. Or checks and balances. Yeah. None of this stuff is in the Bible, so it's not a model for good civic behavior. Yeah, the people who are going to be pandering to these types of groups, you know, they talk about the Bible as if it is the thing that we've drawn our society from like here's what the bible says and look it's exactly like our representative republic works and it's just the two do not match up at all it's, it's total nonsense this yeah. country was not founded on the bible even the preamble to the constitution many of constitutions um say and depending upon divine providence or something like that we ask our blessing our blessings on us our constitution doesn't say that it says we the people do ordain and establish and so it's a very important point that you make it's just a false notion that this country was founded on religious principles people sometimes refer to the declaration Declaration of Independence, which does have this phrase, our rights endowed by our Creator. But it's important to know the Declaration of Independence is not any part of the laws of the United States. It's right. not it's, part of the it's Constitution. Not it's not a governing document. It's no, no court decisions have ever been dependent upon the Declaration of Independence. And it was written at a different era uh, for different purposes. Um, and when we declared our independence from Great Britain, we were, in effect, divorcing the king, but we're also divorcing the king's religion because the King of England is the head of the Church of England, right? right? So you couldn't divorce one without divorcing the other. So it's very important to understand that the Declaration, even though it has this rather modest phrase about our creator, it's not part of the governing body of the United States. And now, you've also been teaching a class at Tufts about the separation of church and state for the past couple of years. Is that right? Well, just one semester. I taught that Tufts has a special program in which um, they invite members of the community to suggest a course. And so it seemed logical that I should teach a course 
Calvinism, separation of church and state. So what was that class about? What did you talk about? Well, the Abington case was not the only case. In fact, it was part of a long series of Supreme Court cases going back as far as the McCollum case in 1948, which came out of Illinois, because Illinois had a program in which ministers and preachers and pastors would actually come into the schools and on a what they called a release time program, kids would stop doing algebra and English and history and go off to these religious classes. Mm-hmm. Well, Vashni McCollum had three sons and she didn't want her kids to have to go to these religious classes. And that became a very big problem. The school accommodated them in a certain degree because they didn't. what would happen is the Lutheran kids would go to the Lutheran pastor, the Catholic kids would go here, and I don't know what happened to the Jewish kids. You know, they didn't exist or something. <laughs> <laughs> but the McCollums were non-religious, and there was no place for a non-religious kid to go. What's more is that when they tried to exempt or allow a child to be excused from this, it required the child to self-identify as a non-believer, as a dissident, a non-conformist, or whatever, which often invited ridicule and sometimes bullying and things. So that was a very important case, and they won in the Supreme Court in 1948 and said that you cannot use the school authority and resources to bring religious leaders into the school to teach classes. It's a violation of the Establishment Clause and the Free Exercise Clause. Right. And also having the opportunity where kids can decide to opt out if they want to is often not good enough. I think it was in the opinion written from your case as well, that children are not noted for their willingness to stand up to uh, peer pressure. Well, I mentioned there was a little bit of a glitch in the history of the the Supreme Court, but after we won in the district court, the legislature in Pennsylvania and Harrisburg, in its infinite wisdom, amended the law to allow a child to be excused, which had not been a phrase in the original law. So the Supreme Court looked at that change and sent it back to the district court for reconsideration. So we won again at the district court level. And as you pointed out, the uh, Supreme Court noted two or three important things. Uh, One, the phrase that you're remembering is that children are not noted for their resistance to the force of social suasion. It's a (laughs) beautiful phrase. More eloquent than I can put it. (laughs) But as I pointed out before, for a child to be excused, how is it going to work in practice? First of all, if you have a PA system in the school, you can't escape it. Mm -hmm. Second of all, a child would have to get up, self-identify as being a non-believer or or something, or a member of a different religion, um, and go someplace, like stand in the hall or something, right, Mm -hmm. during the morning devotions. Well, First of all, standing in the hall is sometimes used as a punishment for kids, isn't it? (laughs) Yeah. And and as I said before, it invites bullying and ridicule and taunting and, you know, and and it's just unfair. I mean, it's simply unfair to make a child have to do that, either violate the family's religious views or his or her own religious views or face punishment or ridicule or something else. And we don't need it. I mean, it it turns out, actually, the world has not stopped spinning just because we don't have Bible reading in the schools. Right. (laughs) Now, some people, of course, claim that the world has gone to hell in a handbasket, and now we have all of these school shootings and all sorts of other horrible things. Well... I think on the whole, there is better behavior in the schools than there was back in my time. In my time, it was very common for children of various ethnic groups to be labeled with some rather nasty names or something, sometimes beat up just because you were Jewish or just because you were Italian or something. So that kind of bullying and schoolyard violence has actually diminished quite a good bit. Now, we didn't have school shootings, but that was largely because kids didn't have access to guns in those times. So that's not a sign of anything, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. And overall, we've got more respect for both girls in school, for minorities of all sorts, for religious minorities, Jews and whatever, even Catholics. And we're a very pluralistic society now. I mean, we have substantial numbers of people who are Muslim, Hindu, Buddhist, Zoroastrian even, probably, (laughs) uh, Sikhs. um, And so the idea that there's one size fits all in religion is just simply absurd and couldn't possibly work in today's environment. I wanted to mention that the um, Abington case was one part of a long series, one of which, starting in 1948 in McCollum, but then in 1962, there was a famous case known as Engel versus Vitale, which had to do with the New York Board of Regents prayer that was imposed upon New York kids, and that was declared unconstitutional. And there's a very memorable phrase from that that I like to quote. The court ruled that it is no part of the business of government to be composing prayers. Mm -hmm. And I think we should remember that phrase. What is the business of government? And when you go to school board meetings or city council meetings or something, why do we have to have a prayer to start the activities? You know, the business of government has nothing to do with prayer. And um, so this is an unnecessary imposition. And that's the Greece, New York case that uh, you mentioned before. Mm-hmm. Greece is a little town outside of Rochester. And they want to continue having really quite Christian prayers. I mean, uh, praying in the name of Jesus and all that. Well, it's brought before the Supreme Court. Americans United for Separation of Church and State 
is the lead group trying to get the court to agree that these practices are an imposition and violate the Establishment Clause. And it's been joined in by American Humanists, Freedom from Religion Foundation, American Atheists, a whole group of organizations have submitted amicus briefs and have collaborated on the legal arguments. But it hasn't been decided yet, and it's hanging in the balance. And I don't know that the um, Abington case could have been won with today's court. The um, conservative group is very strong and tend to be a majority. It's an also an interesting thing that the court has become enormously imbalanced. Never before in our history, six out of nine of the justices are Roman Catholic. Mm-hmm. It's never been quite uh, that imbalanced. And, um, you know, uh, lots of good Catholics. Some of these are some super conservatives who have uh, very authoritarian views in their decisions. And it's not healthy for the court, and it's not healthy for the nation. Yeah, you know, our modern-day rather conservative justice, Justice Scalia, I don't think would be at all interested in favoring the, the outcome of the Abington. No, no and uh, Alito, likewise, has said that he doesn't see any problem with having religion in public life. And I just find it unnecessary. I mean, uh, people can have whatever beliefs they want, go to whatever church they would like, but why do we have to impose this on, on the public? Well, and it's probably very easy for them to rationalize that position because they're saying, sure, let's let religion be in schools. But of course, they know that the religion that they hold is the majority religion. If they were in a much more diverse culture where there were going to be lots of Hindu prayers and lots of Muslim prayers coming in, I'm sure that they would not be all that enthusiastic. You're 100% right about that. I'll tell you a little anecdote from our own oral arguments at the Supreme Court. The school board was arguing that Bible reading and recitation of the Lord's Prayer is not really religion. It uh, instills moral values and all sorts of things. And so one of the justices interrupted and said, well, now, um, oh, and, and of course they argued that the people have voted for this. So this justice said, uh, well, you know, in Hawaii, I think there might be a majority of people who are Buddhist. Would it be okay to have a Buddhist prayer in the Hawaii schools? Because that's the majority of wish. And the attorney for the school board was absolutely flummoxed. And <laughs> he blustered him, blah, 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 <laughs> until he got his bearings. And he, he didn't want to say, yes, a majority vote for a non-Christian prayer would, would be okay. On the other hand, he was hoist on his own petard. <laughs> right. So your point is very well made. Wasn't there also some interesting commentary on uh, on your case, the Abington versus uh, Shemp case, where they said, well, the Lord's Prayer is not sectarian, at least among our group. <laughs> <laughs> we had expert testimony in our district court case. One was um, Rabbi Solomon Grizel, who was a noted Jewish scholar, and uh, Dean Weigel, who was uh, dean of the Yale Divinity School. Dean Weigel was arguing that the Bible is not really a sectarian book, and then he wasn't quite sure where to put the New Testament versus the Old Testament, because the New Testament is certainly not Jewish. (laughs) And finally, after some skilled questioning from our attorney, he said, well, I guess I would have to say the Bible is non-sectarian with regard to Christians. And even that, of course, actually is is wrong. I mean, most people do not know that there is a Catholic version of the Bible. It's the Douay Rhymes translation version. And it's quite different from the King James Protestant versions. And, of course, there's any number of Protestant versions, 10 or 20, the New Revised and New International, whatever. But the Catholic Bible has different language for many verses. It actually contains, I think, six books that are actually not in the in the Protestant Bible, were right. taken out by Martin Luther is on the grounds that they were not, I don't know, godly enough or biblical enough or something. I don't know. Anyhow, so these books are in the Catholic Bible and not in the Protestant one. The Catholic Bible numbers the Ten Commandments differently and manages to put the one about not having any graven images into a kind of footnote. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would, that would be hard to reconcile with the Catholic Church. Yes, <laughs> exactly. So, I mean, these are very substantial differences. But one of the things I noticed when I was a kid, people recited the Lord's Prayer. The Catholics said it rather a bit differently than the Protestants did. They ended it somewhat differently. So, again, it, it just shows that there cannot be one size fits all in prayer and religious books and sacred scriptures and all that sort of thing. Right, yeah. And and I think it's good to point out that even amongst the Christian groups, there's going to be divisions about what literature and what prayers are are appropriate. I have some rather conservative evangelical friends who think that the New International Version translation of the Bible is terrible and no one should ever read it. They want you to be reading the 1511 King James Version. Exactly. I've I've heard um, such types get up and talk about the satanic version of (laughs) it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. (laughs) Devil-influenced translation. And you walk up and down the street and you recognize very quickly how many different denominations are in this country. Actually, I, there was a count up on this about, I, it came to about 190 different denominations, but everybody remembers, you know, Baptists and Methodists and Presbyterians and Lutherans and all on it goes. But 
you know, why are these different denominations? Because they have different beliefs. <laughs> they interpret the Bible differently in different ways. And even amongst those, I mean, there's the Free Baptist, the Southern Baptist, the Northern Baptist, you know, on and on it goes. Right. Um, and these constant schisms and divisions indicate that people can't agree, <laughs> don't agree. Otherwise, there'd be one religion that everybody would go to it. <laughs> right, yeah, exactly. Well, so you've also been, in addition to all of your incredible secular activism, you've also been a very accomplished scientist. You've done some really cool work at GE and Bell Labs and all these different places. And I guess as a part of that, you've also been very involved in science education and good science education. I'm a, I'm a big supporter of the National Center for Science Education, NCSE, mm-hmm. which is the premier organization to fight against bringing creationism and intelligent design into the public schools. They've yeah. done an excellent job. In my own scientific career, I was always interested in the properties of of molecules, how the uh, everybody has a picture in their mind of the electrons going around an atom, but what happens when two atoms come together and form a molecule, and what do the electrons do mm-hmm. um, in that situation? And that's, you know, molecules are pretty important to us. Exactly. <laughs> So um, I used a technique called nuclear quadrupole resonance as part of nuclear magnetic resonance, and nuclear magnetic resonance eventually evolved to become MRI, so I was in on MRI, was just getting started, and and I helped radiologists and hospitals to understand the new technology, and then there were a lot of, because it requires a a very big magnet, there were a lot of issues about how you cite one of these things and Mm -hmm. uh, how you prevent passing Volkswagens from getting sucked in and that sort of thing. (laughs) As part of your involvement in the realm of science education, you authored a paper called Warning, Gravity is Only a Theory. What was that about? (laughs) That's my most famous publication on the Internet. (laughs) I wrote it as a spoof on the uh, creationists, and, uh, you know, they claim uh, evolution is just a theory. Right, Well, in that case, gravity is just a theory. (laughs) It's funny. uh, I give that example to people, too. Gravity, it's actually, and correct me if I'm wrong, it's not even a real force. It's one of those imaginary forces. No, that's a real force. I mean, one of the things that's rather easy and significant to know is that in all the years of physics and science and astrophysics and whatever, we only know four forces. Right. There are just four forces, and prayer is not one of them, and spirituality is not <laughs> a force. The four forces are gravity, the strong nuclear force, the weak nuclear force, and the electromagnetic force. The first three of these don't really matter very much. Gravity is only important because there's some big chunks of matter in the universe. But the electromagnetic force, that controls everything having to do with life, everything having to do with molecules, everything having to do with chemistry, everything having to do with grass and trees and mice and bacteria and all humans. Um, That's the force that we understand. And, of course, it represents also our communications. I mean, everybody knows radio and television even computers, all having to do with manipulation, if you wish, of the electromagnetic force. Mm -hmm. That's the one force that we understand extremely well and control to a very large degree and can manipulate to our advantage. It turns out that all of these forces have a kind of distance scale involved with them. And the nuclear forces are very significant because they help hold the nucleus together, and weak nuclear forces are responsible for radioactive decay. But it's very important that the nucleus be held together because every atom has a nucleus, and uh, life would be very different without it. Um, (laughs) but, But those forces only act over distances that are incredibly small, 10 to the minus 13 centimeters or something. You right, know. right. Uh, and gravity works over very long distances, 10 to the plus 13, plus 20 meters. But the electromagnetic force is, and this is speaking a little bit loosely, I guess, works over the distances on the order of a meter. And human beings are, you know, a meter or so high um, and, and big. <laughs> to the nearest meter, yeah. To the nearest meter, right? Um, <laughs> And um, so, and it, it also works in, at the centimeter and even angstrom scale levels of uh, atoms and molecules. So um, that's the force that matters. So everything we know can be explained by these four forces. You don't need God involved in it. You don't need prayer involved in it. And of course, I particularly read the notion that there is some God who intervenes in human affairs. As a humanist, I believe that it's our duty and necessity to sort out things for ourselves. And um, we make up our own ethical values. Well, we were talking earlier that without God, the law of the jungle would return or something. In fact, our ethical values have improved quite a good bit, even in my lifetime. I mean, before my time, women got the right to vote and to own property, and that was significant. And to get out of abusive relationships by divorce or something else, Mm -hmm. you know, all those. Look at the enormous strides we've made in providing equality for African Americans and the civil rights movement and whatever. And I mentioned earlier that uh, the sense of of bullying in in schools, taunting people who are members of a minority or something, has been greatly reduced. Not gone, unfortunately. And now the gay rights, homosexual rights movement has made enormous strides. I mean, 10 years ago, 70% of Americans were opposed to gay marriage. Right, right. Now 55% are in favor. Exactly. (laughs) Don't don't give a damn, which is perfectly good. (laughs) You know, let him marry. What the hell? <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
That's, that's my argument for gay marriage. Is why should I care? Why not? Go ahead, get married. Yeah. yeah. Contrary to what all these uh, conservative political commentators say, gay people getting married is not going to affect me or my marriage in any way. I, yeah, but, but of course their mantra is that you know traditional marriage will die out or go to hell or be right. ruined or I don't know what. <laughs> whatever uh, scary words. <laughs> yeah, whatever. And, and I also like to pay, make this point about the, you know the anti-gay people have always quoted sections of the Bible, particularly Leviticus and uh, homosexuality. And abomination or something. Well, you know, it's a very funny thing. Um, as a result of people getting to actually know real gays when they've come out of the closet, people turn out to believe in fairness and in love right. and, uh, and letting other people alone. And so this has had the effect of dethroning the Bible. I mean, oh, it, it turns point. out that fairness and love count more than Leviticus. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I think that's a very healthy thing. Uh, yeah. uh, of course, Christians have rejected parts of the Bible that they didn't like anyhow for years and years. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, that's it, nothing it, new. It's, it's, yeah, like this, like that, and very amusing that what ninety nine percent of all Catholics practice birth control, and despite yeah. what the church says, and the other one percent are lying. <laughs> <laughs> I would also like to point out that fairness and love together are mutually exclusive from Leviticus anyway. Yes. So if you have to choose one or the other, might as well choose the nicer one. Right? Exactly. The one where you don't get smitten by God for wearing clothes of mixed fiber. <laughs> mixed fibers, sort of yes. I, I I'm sure all three of us are doing right now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think that the whole uh, the gay rights movement has been really positive. I think it's really great because it really looks like it's only going to get better because all of my friends from high school and college who are really interested in politics are all very interested in gay and LGBT. BT rights. So I think that especially as uh, you know more generational changes happen, that that's going to be something that comes more on the forefront, and there's a lot more progress made there. Yeah, and Hawaii actually just yesterday voted yeah. for gay marriage in Illinois too. Uh, so we now have 15 states plus mm -hmm. the DC, and it's only a matter of time, of course, that uh, right. it'll be universal, and and nobody will give a damn. I mean, it turns out that gays move into suburban homes, um, and they have kids, and they play with my kids and their kids, and they mm -hmm. borrow tools, and they cut their grass just like the rest of us, and uh, Nobody cares what they do in their bedroom. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It'll be as blasé to us as interracial marriage. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, yes. I was going to tell you an anecdote. You may want to change the order of this. But when Bible reading was taking place in the schools, in junior high school, ninth grade or something, one of the kids decided he was going to read the begats. Well, you know, there's a whole lot of begetting going on in the Bible, which is usually overlooked in Sunday school. Yeah. <laughs> um, and these go on for quite a long time. And, of course, nobody knows what the heck it means. You know, Abraham begat Joseph and Isaiah. And, <laughs> right. uh, was, and so the next kid thought that was kind of amusing. And so he read from the begats. And this went on for about a week. Um, and then the teacher got really pissed off <laughs> <laughs> and actually violated the law that said without comment because the phrase without comment was yeah. uh, included so that it wouldn't be interpreted in a way that was more favorable to one denomination than another. But he said, no, you can't keep reading the begats. Um, <laughs> the other thing about the Bible reading was that it was a distinctly Protestant tradition. In Catholic tradition, the priest reads the Bible and interprets it for the masses. And for many years, of course, there wasn't even a, an English version of the Bible, so that the educated would read Latin, and that was good enough. In fact, the first English translation of the Bible, a man named um, Tyndall, if I recall correctly, was actually burned at the stake by the Catholics because yeah. they didn't want the Bible to fall into the hands of the masses. Right, right. Uh, I mean, it's pretty horrible burning at the stake. So it was a distinctly Protestant idea, you know, one that was introduced by Luther, and of course, became core of the whole Protestant idea that every man reads the Bible for himself and comes to the truth, whatever that is, of course. Right. We know that they don't come to the truth because there isn't one truth. They come to multiple truths, and that's why they're Baptists and they practice baptism, and some people don't practice baptism and all that sort of stuff. Right, right. right. Uh, but this issue actually arose far, far before my time. In 1844 in Philadelphia, um, and that's where I grew up or was born, uh, there were riots in the street over Bible reading in the schools. And it was the Catholics, of course, largely represented by the newer Irish and, and Italian immigrants, but they objected to hearing the Bible read in the public schools in Philadelphia and Pennsylvania. This got to be pretty serious stuff. Churches were burned. Men, wow. were, men were killed. The governor had to call out the National Guard to quell the riots. There were some riots in New York, too, but the Philadelphia one was the most famous. And as a result of all this, the archbishop or whatever of Philadelphia at the time said that he didn't believe that Catholics could get fair treatment in the public schools, and that's when the parochial school system started. Wow. The parochial school system started as a rejection of Bible reading in the public schools, and that's a very interesting part of the history. <laughs> now turn around the other way. Yes, yes. <laughs> that's the place to go to get a very religious education. Yeah, and the Catholics make a very, very bad argument. They claim that the public schools are secular, and by that they mean anti-God. 
And that's, of course, completely wrong because they want to divide the world into you know the godly and the ungodly. But the word secular means neutral. That's what the Constitution of the United States provides for, a position of neutrality that which government neither hinders nor favors religion of any kind. And so by, in the Catholic view, they've left out that middle ground and then require a false dichotomy that you're either for us or against us, and that you know defines neutrality out of existence, mm-hmm. and that's wrong. The public schools should be secular, non-denominational, and non-religious, and everybody should know about religion. I mean, actually, in favor of having classes on religion, many colleges, of course, do teach a course on comparative religion, and the Bible can be used in history class, certainly in literature. There's any number of allusions to biblical passages, uh, and an art class. But heaven knows, there's so much art that's been influenced by religion, inspired by religion, if you wish. Music, of course, too. So, I mean, there's a place for knowing about these things as part of the culture. That doesn't mean you have to be a believer or have a particular religious belief foisted on you. Yeah, I was in chorus in high school, and we sang a lot of, you know, religious music because for most of the history of Western music, the only way to make a living as a composer was to write for the church. Right. So, you know, a lot of the greatest choral music is religious. Absolutely. I'm a great lover of Mozart and Bach and, you know, right. all of this is religious music. Yeah, some of my favorite pieces are masses or yeah. that sort of thing. But it was never really an issue because we sang about Jesus and God and stuff. But it was thought of as sort of like you're acting. You're playing a part as a person who would be saying these things. Just like, you know, in the school play, if you're the bad guy in the play... You don't actually have to be a bad right, guy. Right. You're, your not, you're yeah. not actually killing anybody <laughs> even though you kill a character in the play. Yes. <laughs> There's a, sort of a separation between what you believe and the art that you're doing. That's right. And I, I think that's a very mature way of looking at it. It is a still a rather contentious issue. And, of course, it comes up with the Christmas carols at Christmas time. And, and I know of cases where parents have objected to um, their kid singing today I'm in, um, in the, because of its religious content. But as you point out, if you took out away all the religious literature, there wouldn't be very much left. <laughs> Anyhow, I was going to go back to tell this one little funny story. I told you, reading the Beget, uh, it was my turn to read one day. And I actually, one of the few times I remembered it should be my turn, so I, I looked up the Song of Solomon. Well, the Song, song of Solomon is quite racy. <laughs> and, yeah, yeah. It, it talks of um, my breasts are like two does in the morning dew. And, you know, they, this is pretty heady <laughs> stuff for 14-year-olds, especially when the authority of the school right? yeah, yeah. <laughs> to even mention breasts. <laughs> and, and then it went on and it ended up that King Solomon had 300 wives and 700 concubines. Mm-hmm. Now, at the time, I aspired to having a single girlfriend, so this was distinctly <laughs> inspiring. <laughs> See, the Bible can be inspirational. I never got that, 300 wives and 700, 700 concubines. concubines. I mean, when you have 300 wives, how are they more important to you than your 700 concubines? <laughs> What's the distinction between a wife and a concubine when you have that many? I would feel terrible if I had that many wives and concubines, because there's going to be some amount of them that are just always left out of my life. And then they're going to want a divorce, and each one of them is going to take half your money. You're going to, <laughs> you'll be left with nothing at the end. Well, luckily, this was the time when women had no rights to do anything like this. Right. So, right. So Those was, were the days. <laughs> exactly. Well, here we are in 2013. This Supreme Court was decided in 1963, so this is the 50th anniversary year. That's right. Um, and I sometimes a bit sad that we're still fighting so many of the same issues, and I would have thought that many of these were resolved over the last 50 years. Now, there have been, you know, advances. I mean, I keep pointing out that Abington is only one part of a series following after Abington uh, was Lee versus Weissman having to do with prayers at graduation and uh, their issues about prayers at football games and about uh, whether coaches can force their team to uh, recite prayers before games and a whole bunch of things. Yeah, uh, we got uh, the lemon uh, test as well. The, le- the lemon test, uh, incidentally, Lemon came from Philadelphia, oh, okay. and, he, and he just died this summer. It was too bad. So in a, following on the Abington case, I lost track of maybe 14, 15 other cases that have expanded on the notion that the schools have to be neutral and secular and in all the activities that schools do, like sports games and graduations. But these issues are get rehashed, I guess, on a fairly regular basis, and it seems that maybe the country should have moved on, and we have our secular, pluralistic, diverse student populations. Just leave them alone and let uh, atheists and uh, non-believers alone. Mm-hmm. And uh, I also like to mention that I'm a very big supporter of the Secular Student Alliance, which has formed chapters, and I think 
something like 400 uh, college campuses so that free thinkers and agnostics and atheists have a place to go and feel uh, their comfortable environment to understand and talk to each other um, in contrast to you know the Campus Crusade for Christ and well, similar organizations. And we're trying to get humanist chaplains on college campuses. Harvard already has one, Greg Epstein, and about four or five other colleges. Oh, uh, Stanford recently hired a humanist chaplain. We're trying to get one at Tufts. So this is important, too, so that uh, non-believers on college campuses can feel that they are represented and they have a seat at the table among all the religious chaplains. And um, the SSA has now formed, I think, about 50 chapters in high schools, you know, for the same reasons. that right. Kids can now find a home there and, and feel comfortable with a group of peers. So I support the SSA. I support the American Humanists. I support American Atheists, Freedom from Religion Foundation, Americans United for Separation of Church and State, and probably several others. <laughs> well, I'd love to get your perspective on this one last thing. There have been so many things over the past several decades that have made the world a friendlier place to the secular community. We've got these great popularizers like Richard Dawkins and Sam Harris. We've got all these different secular organizations like the Secular Student Alliance, which makes it easier for especially younger generations to acclimate and feel a part of a community. From your perspective, what do you think would be good for the secular community to start targeting for, I guess, in terms of future growth? What do you think that we should be doing in the future but aren't yet? We don't have a good outreach to the Hispanic community, to the African-American community. These groups have not been active in joining in on uh, secular Mm -hmm. issues and things. And I don't know why. I mean, there is... um, an Hispanic Free Thought Association, I think. So some organizations exist, but right. they're fairly small. And also, I forget what they call themselves, but maybe it's black atheists or something like that, African-American atheists. Uh, but they're still fairly small. So right. bigger outreach is, is one of the things that's important. Another thing that's extremely important, in my opinion, is to make it clear to politicians that we are non-believers and we vote. Mm-hmm. So the Secular Coalition and uh, American Humanists have set up a political action committee which is looking for donations, and these monies will be used to support candidates that favor secular values. So it's important that we be recognized as a voting bloc. Many, many polls have shown that the number of non-believers has risen dramatically in the United States, and depending on how you ask the question and various things, it's somewhere between 15 and 20 percent of Americans identify as non-believers or agnostics. You know, all these words are a little complicated. And On college campuses, um, maybe as many as a third of entering students are putting down none as their religious preference, and these have begun to call themselves the nuns. Uh Not every nun, uh, N-O-N-E, is a non-believer necessarily, but doesn't want to be affiliated with any traditional formal religion. Well, you know, maybe 15% doesn't sound like too much, but, you know, we're a nation of 300 million. 15% represents 45 million of us, (laughs) and that's a very significant number, and uh, no politician can afford to lose 20% of the vote. Right, yeah. And so he, we need to know, and that's one of the things the Secular Coalition is going to be doing, is to make it clear to politicians that we do vote, and our votes matter. Exactly. And they can make the difference between winning and losing. I, th- I, think that's, I think that's spot on. So that's my favorite hobby horse at the moment. <laughs> Good. Well, it has been so much fun getting to sit down and chat with you. You've had an incredibly productive life in a lot of areas that I think are really, really important. And it's been such an honor to sit down and have you on the show. So thank you so much for coming on, Ellery. Well, thank you very much. Um, you mentioned my scientific work. I always like to mention that I did a lot of interesting mountain climbing and uh, exploring. When I was at Tufts, I had the very good fortune to go to Antarctica with my geology professor, Robert Nichols. So this was in 1960. You can't get to Antarctica on your own steam, so it had to be sponsored by the National Science Foundation. So I've been to within 800 miles of the South Pole. I've also worked in in Greenland and uh, Canadian Arctic, so I've been to within 400 miles of the North Pole. I've climbed in the Alps and the Himalayas, um, Sierra Nevadas, the Rockies. So I've had a lot of mountaineering and mountain climbing and adventuring and expeditioning, I guess. Um, you were on the first American team to try and climb. It was like the highest mountain in Pakistan, right? Uh, yes, Nanga Parbat. You have an excellent memory, yes. <laughs> um, Nanga Parbat is the world's ninth highest mountain, and we were part of the Pittsburgh Explorers Group, and we wanted to be the first American team. It had been climbed uh-huh. before, but we wanted to be the first American team to do it. That ended in tragedy, unfortunately. Um, Two of our party were killed by a rock slide. And, it was, oh. and then there was, before we understood fully what, what had happened and what was going on, um, there was, of course, a rescue effort. And um, I myself fell and very badly broke my ankle at about 16,000 feet. And uh, that's caused me difficulties to the present day. It's rather arthritic. So I've done a lot of interesting things, not only in physics and chemical physics. That was sort of my specialty. Um, but it's been an interesting life to be involved in the separation of church and state issues. And I meet so many interesting and exciting 
people via this route. Okay, well, thanks for coming on the show, and thanks for everything you've done for the world. Thank you, Gabe. Thank you, Dan. It's been fun. Well, boy, that was a lot of fun. What do you think, Dan? Woo! I had a great time. <laughs> what did you enjoy about it, Dan? Uh, well, for a second there, I thought you were going to ask me, what did I learn? <laughs> and that would have been a harder question. I enjoyed, uh, I enjoyed contributing, I think, three times total. <laughs> uh, that, that was a lot of fun. Eric, my other co-host, has complained that I always usurp whatever is going on in the conversation when we have a guest on. But uh, yeah, I don't think yeah. so. Well, you know, I think Eric might promote that behavior in you <laughs> by unsurping the conversation. <laughs> Not sure that that's a word. I am sure that it is a word. Well, anyway, it was a total blast getting to speak with Dr. Ellery Shemp. Very, very happy that he was able to be on the show. So, cool. All right. And uh, Eric, send us off. (laughs) That'll be good. 